Yeah, I, I have salt for Tim. Yeah. We're going to use this. I think we're ready to go. Okay. Good afternoon and welcome to the Real World Perspectives on Poverty Solutions Speaker Series. We are really delighted to have you all here today, uh, both in person here in the ECC room at the School of Social Work and also joining us virtually uh, on YouTube. I'm really excited about uh, our talk today uh, from Dr. Yvette Perfecto. Um, I am also the instructor of a course that runs alongside this speaker series. We've reached our midpoint, um, the fourth in seven lectures today. Um, I want to remind the students to record your attendance on classquestion.com as per the syllabus. Um, and with that, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Mara Osfeld, uh, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you all for being here. Um, and thank you, Trevor. Can we just all recognize Trevor who's organized this whole speaker series? This is the fourth event. So if we could just take a moment to acknowledge everything Trevor's done, like to just recognize that. Because it is a lot of work and he really pulled together a great slate. So thank you. I am really honored to be here today introducing Yvette. Yvette Perfecto is the James E. Crowfoot Collegiate Professor of Environmental Justice. She's a widely recognized leader in the environmental justice mo movement and broadly interested in the links between small scale sustainable agriculture, biodiversity, and food sovereignty. I personally learned about Yvette after Hurricanes Irma and Maria hit Puerto Rico in 2017 and left much of the island's coffee, plantain, and citrus crops decimated. In fact, some estimates say these hurricanes caused about $2 billion in damages to the local agriculture. And while my daughter and I and my mom were making t-shirts and organizing bake sales, I learned that Dr. Perfecto was leading a team of researchers from the University of Michigan to enhance the resilience and sustainability of the agriculture sector. Specifically, her team was working on a gasifier that would turn coffee husks, clippings, and other agricultural waste into fuel that would power hybrid microgrids, which looked a lot better than my t-shirts. The byproduct of the process could then be used to even improve the soil quality. So she has a long record of doing really novel and interesting work. This is just one of the many examples of ways that Dr. Perfecto has served as a leader in the ecology, in the ecology and agroecology fields. She's authored four books as well as a ton of articles. She's a founding member of the Alianza de Mujeres and Agroecología, the Alliance of Women in Agroecology. She's a member of the Science for the People a member of the New World Agriculture and Ecology Group. She's an elected fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, a senior fellow of the Ecological Society of America, and a senior fellow of the Michigan Society of Fellows. Earlier this year, Dr. Perfecto was also elected to the National Academy of Sciences, one of the highest distinctions of a scientist or engineer in the U.S. So with all of those accolades and accomplishments in mind, I'd love to introduce, introduce Dr. Yvette Perfecto. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a pleasure for me to be here. Let me shift microphones. So, uh, I was telling Trevor that I haven't been back here for a long time. I used to come a lot to the International Institute because uh, I was working with uh, Latino studies for a while. And so, but I haven't been back into this building for a long time. So it's a pleasure to be here. I have been working in coffee systems for many, many years. And my area is agroecology. And I basically, I look at the intersection between conservation of biodiversity and agroecology and agricultural systems. And so you might ask, why, why are you here in a poverty symposium? <laughs> so that's why I asked Trevor when he first invited me, but uh, I managed to get a connection there. Uh, obviously coffee, coffee is a very interesting crop uh, that allows you to look uh, at both conservation of biodiversity, ecology, uh, agroecology, and also issues of, uh, of uh, a, cultural, social, uh, economic implications for farmers. So let me start just by talking about, just 
biodiversity and agriculture. Uh, we tend to think that agriculture, when we think about agriculture, we tend to think that agriculture uh, does, not, uh, does not maintain a high level of biodiversity. No, we tend to think about agricultural systems as biological deserts, no biodiversity. But it's, these systems could be important for biodiversity. And the fact is that about 40% of the Earth's terrestrial surface is in agricultural system. So they ha it, that has very important implications for biodiversity conservation. But the reason we think that there's, you know, they're not important for biodiversity or that they are not, sorry, it's going in the reverse. I'm sorry. Uh, Trevor? If I use this, it's going ahead. Oh, so I, it's, it's a reverse, yeah. Not sure what's going on. Okay, let's see. Maybe I use this arrows. Okay. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, little technical difficulty here. But the reason we think that biodiversity, uh, that agriculture is not uh, important for the conservation of biodiversity is because when we think about biodiversity, we think about these systems. So it's not that we don't think that it's important for biodiversity conservation, it's that we think that it's bad for biodiversity conservation, no? That agricultural systems basically destroy biodiversity and convert areas into biological deserts. But those are not all the systems that are, the agricultural systems that are available in the world, no? We have a lot of diverse farming systems like the ones that you see here that, are, that can contribute to the, the conservation of biological diversity. And so one of those systems is the coffee agroecosystem. Now, this is a shaded coffee farm in uh, where I work in Chiapas, Mexico. And you can see that, you know, it has a lot of trees. It has a lot of diversity there. It basically resembles a forest. Now, before I go into the details of this system, why study coffee system? Why, why coffee is so important? Well, first of all, I, I'm think, I think that many of you will agree with me that coffee is a very important beverage to maintain us, you know, alert especially in the morning. And I love this quote by Peter Gugliano that say, great coffee is this amazing miracle. It's warm deliciousness in the morning, transform even the most rough ed edge, in the edge of us into intelligent, sparkling, upstanding men and women. And I think I agree with him that uh, in the morning, you know, in order to, to get that energy, I need my coffee. But also coffee is a uh, drink by a lot of people. So you have uh, about 400 billion cups of coffee that are consumed every year. Coffee is extremely important also for the 60 million people that depend on it for their livelihoods. And that includes farmers, farm workers, and people associated with the, with the coffee uh, system in the global south. And so it's very important economically uh, for those people. And also uh, it's important, an important crop for indigenous people. Uh, in, um, there are about 820 different indigenous groups in the coffee growing region. Many of them actually participate in the production of coffee. Uh, and, um, and these indigenous groups in Mexico, for example, you have a very large number of uh, indigenous people that are involved in, in coffee production. Okay, so shade coffee and biodiversity. The shade coffee is very important for conserving biodiversity for two reasons. One, it provides what, or it represents really a high quality matrix through, through which wildlife can move so this is important when you have fragments of forest and wildlife need to move from one fragment to another fragment. And if what you have in between is a monoculture with intensive pesticide use and all that, that basically hamper or, or diminish the ability of the organisms to move around. So coffee represents 
in the coffee landscape where you have this kind of coffee systems, this kind of uh, shaded system, it represents a high quality matrix through which organisms can move around and therefore the, their populations can be maintained. But also coffee per se, the coffee agroecosystem or the coffee agroforestry system per se provides habitat for a wide range of biodiversity. Uh, just to give you an example, I, this is a study that I did very, very long time ago when I was just starting doing research in coffee. And um, we basically use the same method that people have used to estimate the number of, uh, of insects or to, to, to see you know, the biodiversity of insects in rainforest. And that is that you put a series of funnels like that, you fog the canopy to kill the insect of a single tree, you collect everything that falls, and then you, you basically spend a lot of time identifying the insects and seeing what is there. So we found in this very little study uh, where we found the canopy of one tree, we found beetles, these are beetles, one type of insect, 126 species in only one tree, in the canopy of one tree, on the canopy of one tree. Then we found another, another tree and we found 110 species in the canopy of another tree. But the most amazing thing is that the overlap the species that were in common between these two trees, individual trees, and they were not huge trees, they were, you know, like 10 meter in, in, in height, um, fruit trees, and the overlap was only 14%. So this shaded coffee farm that we were sampling, from where we were sampling these insects, actually uh, had an enormous amount of biodiversity in the canopy. Uh, of those trees. A lot of studies have been done. Uh, there are a lot of review papers that have been done uh, on biodiversity in these shaded coffee farms. And uh, there's a documentation for trees and epiphytes and other plants in, in the coffee system, ants and other insects, reptiles, amphibians, birds, mammals. All of these show that uh, this diverse farming system, this, this agroforestry system maintain high levels of biological diversity. So they're really good at conserving biodiversity. Now what happened was uh, that in 1980, there was a technification process throughout Latin America, mostly northern, uh, the northern part of South America and Central America and Mexico. That technification happened because in the 90, in the 80s, I don't know if you are familiar with this, the history of Latin America, but the 80s, the 1980s was considered the lost decade of Latin America, meaning that the Latin American countries had accumulated enormous debt, mostly to the World Bank and other development banks, and they needed to pay that debt. And Latin American countries needed hard currency in order to pay the debt and the United States came to the rescue, like they always do, came to the rescue basically to give a loan, uh, not a loan, but a, a, they invested $81 million a, in, in some of these countries in Central America to intensify coffee farm because coffee was one of the main export crops, or still is one of the main export crops throughout Mexico, Central America, and Northern South America. And so the idea here is, was to intensify coffee production in order to increase the, the yields, increase production, and have more, basically, more, more hard currency with the ex exportation of coffee. Uh, this technological, or what, what we call intensification of coffee or technification of coffee, was almost like a green revolution package, technological package, that included high yield varieties, high yielding varieties of coffee, reduced or, or elimination, reduction or elimination of all the shade trees, increased application of herbicides, fertilizers, fungicides, so agrochemical use, and increased density of coffee. So with this combination of, of things, uh, the, the yields in the coffee farm would increase. Now, what happened then is that, for example, this is in Costa Rica, in the Central Valley of Costa Rica in 1970. If you flew over the Central Valley of Costa Rica, you would see something like this. And many of those farms were turned into something like this. 
which is an intensive coffee monoculture. Now, from the point of view of biodiversity, obviously, this is problematic. Now, this is a map uh, that was published in a review paper a uh, few years ago that showed the areas of intensification. And, uh, and so the, the gray color, the light gray color, signify the areas where coffee was turned into monoculture, no, no shade trees whatsoever. Uh, and the, la, the, the, the little bit darker gray is where shade was low, very low shade, but still a few trees. And then the, the dark one is represent shaded coffee. And so you can see before this technification project, basically a lot, almost all of the coffee farms in Central America were, and Northern uh, South America were shaded coffee farms. After the intensification project, you have a lot of them that turn into very low, low shade, low density of shade trees, et cetera. So uh, a lot of conversion uh, of those farms. Now, you don't have what you have, and I want to give you a, a flavor for how these farms look like. This is the most diverse type of farms. No, this is what, what in Mexico they call rustic coffee, where you eliminate only the understory of the, of the, of the forest and you plant coffee underneath. And so uh, you have that, that system, the rustic coffee, but you can have a little bit less diversity and, uh, of, of shade trees, but still a lot of diversity. Uh, and these trees are all planted, not the natural forest, but these are planted trees. Underneath those trees is coffee. Or a commercial polyculture, which is a little bit more, more um, intensive with less diversity and density of shade trees or what they call a shaded monoculture, which is uh, you still have some trees there, but they are regularly pruned and it's just one species of tree, et cetera, et cetera, all the way to the coffee monoculture. No? So you have a gradient of intensification and that's still the case in many places throughout Latin America. And so you have this gradient, along this gradient you lose biodiversity, no? as you intensify, the coffee production system, you go from a very high diversity associated biodiversity to very low associated biodiversity. And this is some, some of our study from the early days also uh, on ants that show that it's not just a comparison between you know, high shade and low shade, high diversity, low diversity, but you really lose diversity along that intensification gradient. And these agroforestry systems here really maintain at the same level of diversity as the forest, at least for the, for the ant species. These, these are forest plots here. So these, these agroforestry systems maintain the diversity, but as soon as you start eliminating the shade, the, decreasing the shade, uh, the, the, the diversity and the density of trees, that biodiversity declines. So in general, uh, re regardless of what organisms you're talking about, uh, you have a decline in biodiversity. Uh, for different organisms, you're going to have different curves of decline of biodiversity with intensification, whether it's that way or this way. In general, what happens is that you lose biodiversity when you move from a system that is like that uh, to the left to a system that is like that, like the one you see on the right. So uh, we were doing uh, work in this system and we collaborated with the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center. They had been doing a lot of work in these systems and they had noticed that the, the, uh, the density and the diversity of birds here in the northern parts uh, uh, of the continent were, were declining and they were concerned about what was going on uh, in Latin America. And uh, they wanted to basically, one of the main organisms that has been studied in, this, in these systems are the, the birds. And so they, develop, they wanted to provide some incentives for the farmers to be able to conserve the diversity, like the ones you see, the, the coffee farms that you see on the right versus the coffee farm on the left. So there was this trend to intensify because of the money that the USDA was uh, providing and all these programs for intensification. And they wanted to be able to provide some in incentives for the farmers. And they developed this uh, bird-friendly bird -friendly certification program. Now, obviously, 
who decide how the landscape is going to look like, whether it's going to be a monoculture or a shaded uh, system or, you know, a, a rustic system are the farmers that are that are there, no, that are living there, that, that have their farms. They are the ones who make the decision as to how to manage their farms. Now, the farmers are in a very precarious situation throughout the world. We're not talking just about uh, Mexico or Latin America, but throughout the world, most of the, of the coffee farmers are small scale farmers. And they have, uh, they have farms that are small. Uh, some, uh, I, I had some statistics before, but I think I skipped that slide that, that in Mexico, for example, uh, more than 60% or more than 80% of the farmers have less than 10 hectares. Uh, more than 90% of the farmers have less than, less than 10 hectares. More than 60% have less than one hectare. So these are very small farms. And uh, they're not very well compensated. Now, coffee is a commodity that uh, is traded in the international market. And the farmers have very little saying, or no saying, not very little, no saying uh, into uh, what the price of coffee is going to be. So this is a chart that shows the price, the fluctuations in the price of coffee, the international price of coffee. And you can see that uh, today or yesterday it was 180, no? Is that what they say there? 180? So that's, that's what it was uh, yesterday when I last checked. And uh, you can see that there's a lot of fluctuations. Sometimes go up really high, sometimes go up really low. Right now is more or less intermediate. Uh, but the thing is that the Fair Trade Organization, Fair Trade International, uh, had decided based on, you know, on, on the cost of living, et cetera, and this, this obviously is very different in different countries, but they have decided that a fair price for farmers is $1.40 per pound. And so that's, they base, basically they base their price in the fair trade market, they base their price on that. So that's their bottom, that's their bottom price. And to that, they add then some premiums, no? But that's their bottom price. Now, every time that the coffee, and you can see that there's a lot of times, periods of time where the price of coffee is below that. And uh, every time that the price of coffee goes down, it basically throw millions of farmers into poverty. It throw millions of farmers into even the extreme poverty of $1.90 per day, no? They make less than that when the price of coffee is low. And so uh, let's look at what, what's, you know, some of the history of this. Now, it's important to understand that the price of coffee was not that low uh, all the time. It's not been that old all the time. Uh, it, this is uh, what happened in 1989. Remember, in 1989, the fall of the Soviet Union, kind of people thought the end of the Cold War, and uh, the airs or, or winds of neoliberalism were, you know, spreading all over the all over the world, especially in Latin America, and that led to the basically the abolishment of the International Coffee Agreement. The International Coffee Agreement was an agreement among coffee producing regions. Almost people call it like a cartel because they established quotas for coffee uh, for the different countries. And that maintained the price of coffee relatively high for the farmers, no? Now, once that end, then it's a free for all. Essentially, any country can produce any amount of coffee that they want, no? And that's precisely what happened. It, production increased dramatically, and here you can see the production of coffee, and that led then to a dramatic decline in the price. Now, obviously, it has come, it has come up, and then it goes down again. There's a lot of variability uh, in, in the system, but that, that was one of the main reasons why there was, in, in 2002, there was a severe coffee, coffee crisis because the price of coffee went to 50 cents per pound for the farmers, paid to the farmers. 
that's that's well it's not even worth harvesting the coffee if you're going to get paid 50 cents and so uh the then uh, there were two reasons for this increase in the pro in the in the coffee production and one of the main reason was uh the enormous increased production in vietnam so vietnam was a coffee producer country but produced very very little coffee to the international market and they decided to invest a lot in coffee now that there's the cartel is not there you know the the, the coffee agreement is not working anymore and they started expanding their coffee production and that's the result no an enormous increase of coffee coming from from vietnam uh actually vietnam in in 20 no, in, in, uh, in 1999 or 19, 2000, around that time, uh, displaced Colombia as the second producer of coffee in the world. So you have Brazil, it's always been the highest producer of coffee. Brazil, to, to a great extent, set the price of coffee. But so Brazil has been producing a lot of coffee and has continued to expand the production of coffee. But then Vietnam started producing a lot of coffee as well. And so that's new coffee that wasn't there in the market before that now is entering the market. Here's a distribution of the coffee producing countries and the circle represent the, basically the, the, the metric tongues that, the, the, that each country produce. And you can see Brazil and Vietnam are the, the top producers. So another contribution to this high increase in, in coffee in the international market was the intensification of coffee. So those intensification programs to increase yield basically also resulted in more production out there. So you have now more production uh, of coffee. Now, the consumers didn't notice or not, do not notice these increases in these declines in the price of coffee. No, uh, In 2002, when the price of coffee went way, way, way down, the price of coffee here for us didn't, didn't change that much. And that's because uh, there's a very high concentration in terms of the roasters at, at the other end of the coffee chain. There's a high concentration uh, here. You can see this is this is a chart that was put together by by Food and Land Use Coalition. And you can see that uh, a cup of coffee, let's say that you pay two dollars and fifty two cents on average. That's the cup of coffee in, in the United States. Uh, this is all that goes on when you go to that coffee shop. A lot of it goes to things that are not the coffee, no? The, the, uh, the staff, paying the staff, taxes, profit, uh, cups and napkins, milk, and then the coffee, 10, 10 cents of that 2.52. And then of that 10 cents, 90% of it goes to the roasters, the processors, the traders and only 10% goes to the farmers. So of the 2.52 cents that you pay for a coffee, a cup of coffee in a coffee shop, one cent goes to the farmer, to the grower. And here you can see the, the uh, distribution of that. It, the, this, this market is estimated to be between two, Approximately in 2015, it was estimated to be $200 billion. Uh, and a lot of it is uh, for the, in the grocery retailing discounter side, then you have the coffee shops and then you have the, the food services, no? And, and here you can see the distribution, 45% at home. So that's the coffee that you buy uh, in the supermarket and you, you brew it at home. Uh, and this is what you buy either in a restaurant or a coffee shop or, or all of that. And that's 55%. So that's, that's a 200 billion. And now it's estimated to be between 250 and 300 billions because that was for, for 2015. Okay, so what are, what are the farmers then doing, you know, to try to overcome the, this crisis of, of low coffee prices? And one of the things that have emerged out of this is the alternative trade uh, in coffee, 
with the labels, different certification programs. One is the organic certification that the farmers get paid some premium for being organic. Uh, another one is the fair trade. There's a little bit of Che grown uh, coffee that's certified that basically uh, a, is a label that, that the, the certification that the farmers can get for having a diverse uh, farm with, you know, shade trees and all that. These are kind of environmental criteria that are used. I don't have time to talk about the difference between this, but, uh, but I'll, I'll just mention a little bit about the organic certification. You do get a premium, but what happens is that when, when the price of coffee goes way, way down, the premium is not enough to be able to give the farmers a, a dignified living, no? So even if they're producing organic coffee and getting a, pri a prime price for it is still low, no? Uh, not enough to make a living. Uh, the fair trade certification have that kind of bottom line, and these this graphs here are, are old, but, but essentially what I want to show here is that it, it does have that bottom line that now is 140, uh, and they also give, if the price of coffee is above that, they also give a premium of 20 cents, 20 additional cents. Uh, so, you know, you can, you can basically uh, be able to make a living if you are uh, receiving a fair, fair trade, or if you have the certification, the fair trade certification. But you need to be part of a cooperative. As an independent farmer, you cannot be certified fair trade. You know, they, they certify cooperatives, uh, which is good because it stimulates the farmers to get associated into cooperatives. No? And so uh, here are the, basically what, what is required from the importers in the fair trade agreement. Direct long-term agreement with the farmers. So they, they have to commit for a long term. They, they can't just go one year and say, okay, we'll pay you this for this year. But they, there's a commitment for a long-term agreement, a guarantee minimum pri a, a price for the coffee, uh, pre-financing. So they, they also provide some financing and they also pay ahead of time so that the farmers can buy uh, you know, the, what, what they need to, to produce. And uh, the national labeling initiatives are responsible for licensing and monitoring at the producers group. And then from the side, and then the, there's also consumer education that they need to do. On the farmer's side, uh, these have, they have to be family-based uh, operations. So small scale family-based operations can be a large farmer that get the, the label. Uh, or the certificate, the certification. They have to be democratic associations as well. So I'm not sure how they determine how democratic an organization is, but they have to have a, a democratic structure. Uh, and uh, they have to commit to pursue ecological goals, uh, conserving uh, natural resources as well. And here you see the, basically the supply chain for the conventional coffee and the supply chain for the fair trade coffee. So the fair trade coffee has less, less uh, steps, basically. No? And that's one of the reasons why they can, can afford to, pi, to pay uh, a premium to the farmers. Uh, here it goes through a lot of stages, and each one of those basically take, take a piece of the pie. Now, how have these certification programs worked for enhancing the livelihood of the farmers? There's a lot of, there have been a lot of studies looking at this, uh, and since there are many certification programs, it's, it's hard to tell sometimes because, you know, they, they, they uh, evaluate certain certification programs, but not others. But in general, the gist of it is that many studies have found that there have been positive environmental and health effects of participating in these certification programs. So the environmental, environmental benefits have been documented. And that includes also for organic production and, and shade fair trade and shade uh, coffee production. The yields uh, have either increased or have experienced no change 
for the organic, the ones that have shifted to organic certification, which is important to note because there's also this idea that uh, organic certificate, I mean, that, that organic production yields lower than the conventional production. And in the case of coffee, that's not the case. On the contrary, there are many cases that the farmers actually increase their yield when they um, uh, become organic. And uh, at the very worst, there's no difference between you know, conventional and organic. And then uh, there are modern, modest income increases due to fair trade certification. So that has been documented. However, the problem is that only few studies have been able to show an improvement that is significant, no? that actually that have tangible effects in terms of reducing poverty of the coffee farmers and increasing the food security of the coffee farmers. So, uh, you know, the certifications have some positive effect, minimal effect on the income, a little bit of positive effect, but minimal, not enough to actually bring people out of poverty. Um, the other thing is that, uh, that participation in cooperatives have been shown uh, to provide better opportunities for the empowerment of the small scale farmers and also for gender equity. So one thing that has happened is the increase, especially after uh, in Mexico, for example, after NAFTA, when the government eliminated a lot of the subsidies and eliminated a lot of the help to the small scale farmers, they, one of the reactions of the farmers were to form cooperatives. And those cooperatives have been fairly successful. And they not only uh, have been able to, uh, to help the farmers get these certifications and all that, but also they have contributed to a better uh, organization, better communication among the farmers, better gender equity, and, and there are other benefits no, that are associated with being part of a cooperative. Now, another new model that is emerging that I think is really exciting, uh, I mean, it, this, this has been going on for a while, but in 2000 and last year, this uh, coffee cooperative got a, a prize, a, the sustainability award for the business model cat in the business model category. And what this is, is a cooperative, it's an international cooperative of coffee farmer cooperatives. And so essentially what they have generated is a group of five cooperatives of coffee farmers. These are all small scale farmers, no? From Guatemala, Mexico, Peru, uh, Nicaragua, and Ethiopia. So these farmers somehow managed to get together uh, and these were cooperatives, no? Of farmers, they already were in, formed into cooperatives but then they form this more this kind of umbrella or meta cooperative. They also have own the processing of the coffee. Now that's really important, no? Because they, then you can process the coffee in your own, and that's one of the advantages of the of the coffee cooperative. But also the roasters. So they own the roasting process, and they uh, open three, two or three coffee shops. I think they were going to open a new one. Uh, in California. So essentially they own, they, they are engaged in the, from the production to the consumption, to the coffee shop. And all the value added goes to the farmers. The farmers are the ones that are uh, the, uh, the owners of these cooperatives, essentially. And uh, due to that model, uh, by creating this value added, the finished product, uh, Pachamama, the name is the Pachamama coffee. So Pachamama coffee capture more of the overall value, resulting in an average price of $3.47 per pound directly paid to the farmers, no? Because they have this integration. Uh, so that's, that's one model. And I've seen this also happening in, in Mexico. It's not an international cooperative, but it's a, a cooperative in Chiapas where the farmers also own uh, one or two coffee shops in the, in the city. And in addition to the roaster and the, the, uh, the processing of the coffee, no? 
So, and, and that significantly improved the conditions, the living conditions of the farmers. In Puerto Rico, I have seen another model, which is kind of the same thing, but it's not a cooperative. It's a, it's a small scale coffee farm owned by a family. But usually these are a little bit, a, how you say, not, not, if you have like one hectare of coffee, you cannot do this, no? But if you have 10, 15, 20 hectares of coffee, uh, and you have a little bit of capital, at least at the beginning, to invest in the, in the, in the dry processado seco, what they call the dry processing plant, which, which you can, you know, you, you can, it's a small scale processing plant, and you can buy also your roster, your, your roasting machine, you can create your own brand of coffee. And this is uh, Café Gran Bate. I, I, I live right in front of this farm in Puerto Rico when we go to work, to work there. And essentially, they, it's the same thing, but at a smaller scale. The same thing as the Pachamama coffee that, that goes on at an international scale with thousands of farmers. This is at the scale of a, of a single family. And I know several, of, several families in Puerto Rico that, uh, that do this. And they do direct selling uh, for people that just go there and buy the coffee there and in the local supermarkets and all that. But they also sell it by, by internet as well. So they sell internationally uh, through the internet. Uh, in this particular case, mainly to the United States. Now, let me just to finish, uh, go back to the shade coffee, because I started talking about biodiversity. And I think it's, uh, it's important also to uh, talk about the environmental value of, this, uh, of these coffee farms. So these diverse systems contribute to cell sufficiency. There's been some study that show that they contribute to cell sufficiency and indirectly promote agency among farmers. And also, in some cases, the consumption and selling of, co of, of coffee product represent, of, of non-coffee product, because when you have a diverse farm, you're producing a lot of other things as well as coffee. And so that non-coffee product uh, represent a fifth to a third of the total monetary value. This was a study that was done in Peru, where there are a lot of diverse, diversified coffee farms. But more importantly, uh, these diverse farms reduce the vulnerability uh, to price fluctuations that you, know, you have in the international market and to climate change. And those graphs that you see there are one of them, the top one is represent the annual average temperature in the coffee belt. Uh, and then the second one, the, the one in the bottom is uh, projections of the loss of yields. There are a lot of models that have been developed to see you know, what, what impact climate change is going to have on yields of different crops and this is for coffee and they are expecting a seven percent decline uh, in coffee yields so uh this this diversified farming systems uh can be very important for buffering those fluctuations and 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 basically uh making the farmers more resilient to climate change and I think with that, uh, what I'm going to say to finish up is that coffee potentially, you know, coffee, coffee production has the potential to uh, lift farmers out of poverty. The way that it's being done right now uh, is not doing that. On the contrary, it's making people uh, be uh, even more poor when the when the price of coffee goes down. But uh, if the farmers get established into these cooperatives, and if they start trying to uh, develop more the value added uh, for the coffee, it is possible, and there are many examples that show that the coffee farmers can come out of poverty and have a dignified living uh, with coffee. So with that, uh, I'm going to leave it because I want to uh, leave some time for questions. Thank you. Can I? I have a microphone. What questions do we have from people here? A bunch. Great. Hey, thank you for being here. Um, I'm curious about when the USAID 
intervened and added that those capital investments. What was the farmer impact from that? Like, I know we have an analogous green revolution that happened in the U.S., and there's so much infrastructure change that reverting to a diversified system can be really challenging. Mm-hmm. So I'm curious, like, for these farmers who are in a more conventional system now, is there machinery or like what are the barriers to going back to that diversification? Is it a simple process? Is it easier with cooperatives? Or do you see like I know in the U.S. it's very challenging for corn, soybean monocultures that are so siloed to move back. And I'm curious if coffee is any easier or more difficult. Yeah. Well, what happened? That's a great question. And one one of the things that happened in in I was in Costa Rica during that time when they were you know promoting a lot and farmers were beginning to change to this more intensive system. But the, the small scale, far, the larger farmers, the large scale farmers, they you know, went all the way and they had the capital no, to invest in the new varieties, in the fertilizers. The small scale farmers went at it very cautiously. They didn't eliminate all the shade. That's why you still have a lot of semi-shade coffee. They didn't eliminate all the shade. Uh, those that started eliminating the shade noticed that they had to spend a lot of money in fertilizer. But at the time they were subsidizing the fertilizer, so okay, but what, what about when, when they don't have the subsidies for fertilizer? They noticed also that the wind was blowing a lot during the dry season, which is the flowering season for the coffee. And now the, because they don't have the shade trees, there's more wind and that was you know, affecting the yields. They also noticed that, that there were more weeds that they had to control the weeds because without the shade trees, and they also had to apply more fertilizer because the shade trees, many of them were nitrogen fixing trees and they eliminate the nitrogen fixing trees. So they, so they were you know, paying attention to what was happening and didn't completely you know, turn into a, a coffee monoculture. Another interesting thing that happened is that um, with, the, with the collapse, of the coffee price in 2002, everybody abandoned their coffee production. You know, it, people, it wasn't even worth collecting the coffee. The, the farmers that had intensified their coffee farms lost everything. The farmers that maintained some diversity in their farms didn't collect the coffee, but they still have the plantains, the avocados, the lemons, the, you know, all these other stuff that either they ate themselves or they sold in the market. And not only that, but uh, the weeds took over, basically, those coffee farms that were monocultures. When you abandon them, the weeds start growing, the vines and cover everything. So they had to invest a lot when the coffee price went up again. They had to invest a lot of money to eliminate all that. And the, the, coffee, the shaded coffee farmers didn't have to do anything because they already they were still managing their farms, you know. And so that's, you know, one thing that I observed when I was there in Costa Rica. But you're right. You know, once you shift to a system and have everything set up for that more intensive system, it's hard to go back. But coffee is not that difficult to produce uh, organically. It just requires more labor. And that's one of the main issues. You know, in Puerto Rico, for example, it's going to be very difficult for farmers to do organic coffee production because it requires a lot of labor and the cost of labor is really high. In Mexico, the cost of labor is not as high. And many of these are family farms that use their own, their own labor. But, but when the labor, um, requirements go up then you need to contract with your neighbors and all that and and then you need more money so thank you just want to mention for students in the class that the attendance um marker is back up um it wasn't created correctly but it's back up if you want to check in on that uh hi um thank you so much for being here i didn't know i could learn i would learn so much about coffee (laughs) I guess um, today, uh, I guess my question is kind of going back to that baseline price that you were talking about, that dignified price. Um, I guess my question is uh, when that price is lowered, um, what are some of the real time effects that it has on these coffee producers? Mm-hmm. And I guess a follow up, if you could provide any insight is who, 
who is kind of on the front line of negotiating these lower prices? Is it usually these larger corporations? Is it somewhere um, uh, further down in the supply chain? Um, any insight uh, would be greatly appreciated. Yeah, no, that, that's a great question as well. Um, the coffee, usually the, the, the farmers sell their coffee at, to what, what is called a coyote, which is an intermediary. And a coyote takes a cut and sell it then to a company. No? So in, in, in Mexico, where I work, in the Soconusco region, the farmers there, uh, if they're, the big farmers have their own, mar they, they negotiate their own contracts directly and all that with buyers in Germany or in the U.S. But the small-scale farmers, they sell their coffee, sometimes not even processed, just the, the berries, uh, that then they need to bring it to a place to, to process and pay for that, or they sell it like that, and somebody... Some intermediary take it to the processing plant and then sell it. So that's, you know, that, that is one of the main problems that, that, that when they get into, when they form a cooperative and the cooperative is big enough that they can have their own processing plant, then that adds more value to the coffee and they end up getting more. So that's one issue. The coyotes are, you know, they take a big cut and, and sell the coffee. Um, the other thing was about the base price. And what was the question again about the baseline? So who decided on... Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, in, in, in very dramatic cases, it lead to extreme poverty, hunger, and it had led to massive migrations. So a lot of the, a lot of the people that have been, uh, I didn't mention this here, but one problem that, that emerged in 2012, 2013, was a, a, a disease that attacked coffee, the coffee rust. And it basically, a lot of farmers went out of business because of that. And so they migrated. And, and a big, there was a big a migration of, of either coffee farmers or, or farm workers that used to work in larger coffee farms that came to the, to the United States primarily. But, but yeah, I mean, it has real consequences. People lose their farms and then have to become farm workers. People who used to be farmers then become farm workers at a much lower income uh, and hunger, malnutrition. It has very, very dramatic consequences. Um, hi, thank hi. you so much for this talk. Yeah, this is you. awesome. Um, the, the person who introduced you mentioned uh, the resiliency uh, projects that you were doing with creating microgrid energy based on waste products from the production. There also seems to be more and more proliferation of the market with uh, cascara products, whether that be cascara syrup or distillate made from cascara, mm -hmm. like Good Vodka is a really cool company doing some interesting work in that space. Mm -hmm. How much do you see diversifying these uh, other financial outlets as ways to support farmers in addition to things like fair trade and organic certifications. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know much because I, I don't know much about the cascara. Uh, I do know that they buy the cascara, which, which is fine. Uh, there might be some issues because a lot of the, the, the cascara is basically when you, you have a berry, a coffee berry, and the processing consists of taking the the pulp out and just leaving the seed and then you dry the seed and then that's what you roast and you you have to do you have to take the the little cover of the seed and you know there are several processes involved but a lot of the time that pulp that you get from the processing of the coffee is used for organic fertilizer when you take that the cascara <laughs> then you're, you're taking the potential for organic fertilizer. Now, a lot of farmers don't compost the cascara. It is, it's left there. Uh, sometimes it goes to contaminate the rivers and things like that. And that, in those cases, I think it's great that you have an additional, an additional uh, 
output that the farmers can sell. And I think, you know, I, I think that um, it's anything that can diversify the income of the farmers, I think, is, is good. The other thing that is happening in many of these, the, the shaded coffee farm is payment for ecosystem services. I mean, I have some mixed feelings about that, but in ter from the point of view of the farmer per se, uh, if you enter into one of these programs, essentially it means that you get additional income by having trees or planting trees in your farm. There are issues with that because some, sometimes farmers just, you know, harvest the trees and then plant trees and they get payment for ecosystem services, especially the large ones, you know. They get payment for ecosystem services by planting the new trees. Uh, but in general, I think that for small scale farmers that, that usually maintain a diversified system, um, if they can receive an extra income for carbon, carbon storage, that's great. I would favor that, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Um, oh. I noticed that Brazil. Can we just, I'm sorry, can we just take the question from your mic? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see over there. Yeah. Sorry. Um, uh, I heard you, uh, you touched on this a little bit throughout the talk, just um, about, um, you mentioned like almost 80 to 90% of the coffee farms in Mexico are small scale farmers. I guess I'm sort of just like um, wondering, um, ah, I, it's so hard to imagine that like um, NAFTA didn't have a, an effect on these things, like so many other aspects of like uh, production in Mexico and the relationship it had with the United States. Uh, was the the coffee, um, did, did much of this, uh, uh, organization in the way these crops were harvested changed before and after NAFTA or was it sort of similar like a no no it had it had a strong you're right it had a strong effect uh mainly because the government eliminated a lot of the programs they had for helping the small scale farmers you know uh that was part of the agreement and in some I mean there are so many different programs and there's still some programs no but at that time they eliminated, you know, to, be, to comply with the agreement with, with NAFTA, they eliminated a lot of subsidies for the farmers, a lot of programs that, that provided some income to the farmers. And, and so it had a negative effect in, on many farmers. However, the, 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 positive, the positive outcome of that, as I mentioned before, was that that stimulated some coffee farmers to form cooperatives. And those cooperatives were very successful for the most part. They have been very successful. And they actually negotiate uh, in response to the previous question. They, if they are a big cooperative that group a lot of small scale farmers, they can actually negotiate prices directly with the buyer. Like, you know, you can talk to a coffee, sh a roaster in the United States, and there are several roasters that do. Uh, work specifically with cooperative and with fair trade cooperatives, and they negotiate the price directly with the with the uh, roasters here. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I noticed that Brazil, the largest producer, also had the greatest proportion of monoculture versus shaded production by a pretty significant margin. That circle was almost entirely light gray. Yeah. Why do you think that is? And are they the largest producer simply because of their huge landmass? Or is there more to it than that? Yeah, well, because Brazil has such a big landmass, that's one of the reasons why there's so many coffee, and, and in an area that is good for coffee production. But for some reason, when coffee was introduced to the Americas, and to Brazil in particular, rather than being introduced as a, coffee is normally an understory plant. So it was domesticated from the understory of a forest. In, in Ethiopia, for example, uh, the nat there are natural coffee forests. There are natural forests that have coffee growing in it, and they actually sell that coffee. Uh, when when, when uh, coffee was brought to the Americas, it was brought with this system that required the shade trees. But for some reason that I don't know, that I don't understand, when it was introduced in Brazil, it was introduced with no shade trees. And since then, it has been produced like that. There has been a kind of a reversal in Brazil has been like the reverse. There have been a reversal among the small scale farmers to plant shade trees on their coffee farm. But it has taken a lot of convincing because the tradition there is to produce coffee without shade trees. 
And, um, but they, they also have a lot of larger scale farmers in, in Brazil. And the other thing is that they produce a different variety of, a different species of coffee, which is Cofea Robusta. So in the market, the market of coffee, and I don't know if you, when you saw the production of coffee, it had two different colors. One is Cofea Arabica, which is a high quality coffee that's producing up in the mountains, the highlands. And the other one is Cofea Robusta, which is the lower quality coffee that is used for like, sub, the, like uh, instant coffee and kind of a bad quality coffee. That, the majority of the coffee that, that Brazil produced is Robusta, is not, and also Vietnam actually, is Cofea Robusta, not Arabica. So that opens a little bit the market of the Arabica coffee, the higher quality coffee for, uh, for this, the farmers in the other regions. So very, when you go to a coffee shop and you look for, you know, like where the coffee is coming from and all that, very rarely you see coffee from Brazil. You know, these are high quality coffee that come from Honduras or Guatemala, Ethiopia, este, maybe Peru, Nicaragua, no? Mexico, but you hardly ever see Brazil. There is some in Brazil that is high quality and, and that is produced up in the higher elevation. And because they're so big, you know, it's a significant amount. But relatively speaking, most of the coffee that is produced there is, is the Robusta coffee. These are really great questions. Thanks. I'm grateful to our partners at the School of the Environment, Graham Sustainability, and the Matai Botanical Gardens. I'm forgetting a bit of uh, different people into the into the mix. Do we have any other questions, comments from the audience? I'm gonna I'm gonna end with just one question. Okay. Um, we've learned a bunch in this series about kind of some of the ways that our patterns here in the United States um, put people into poverty, particularly around debt. You're looking at a kind of large system and then in looking at that large system are looking at a kind of matrix and an ecosystem. So it's a very, very complex thing that you've done a wonderful job of showing us today. Um, do you have any comments on kind of large systems versus kind of very small efforts in terms of poverty alleviation? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's, that, that's a big question. And uh, because the coffee system is such a, you know, it's, it's such a large system. Uh, it's, uh, there are some issues that are at the macro level that affect directly the coffee farmers, no? You have this commodity, you have the price that is determined in the international markets and the farmers are basically at the mercy of that, no? Uh, before 1981, there was a system that wasn't perfect, but there was a system in place to protect the, the farmers, no, the coffee farmers. Uh, after that, it, it collapsed and, and now it's like, a, like I mentioned before, a free for all. Uh, I think that you can look at, that system can, can be seen also at the macro, micro level because the coffee farmers in Mexico, you know, get organized in a different way that the coffee farmers in, in Brazil or the coffee farmers in, in Puerto Rico or in, in other places, no? And, and because of the, con the local conditions of the country, how supported the government is and, and what are the infrastructure that's available and all that, you're gonna have differences from the different countries. And so maybe not, you cannot come with a general solution for everybody, but I think that there are some, some kind of rule of thumbs that you can think about. And as I mentioned before, you know, farmers that work independently, unless they have enough capital to invest to, to take advantage of the entire uh, food chain or coffee chain, they're not gonna be able to make a living with coffee. Uh, but if you get into a cooperative and if you get this certification and if you get into, you know, they take control of the, of the entire chain, then you're going to be able to make it. But I'm not sure, you know, I guess I didn't answer your question. <laughs> no, I think, I think you did a great job. Thank you so much for your presentation today. Let's give. Well, thanks um, for inviting me. Yeah, yeah thank you.
See you all next week for Nyron Crawford. Who's coming next week? <laughs>